Chapter 7. The next three or four weeks flew by in a whirl of excitement. By the time they were ended, I found it hard to recognize myself in the indolent, listless, extravagant man of fashion I had so suddenly become. Sometimes at stray and solitary moments, the past turned back upon me like a revolving picture in a glass with a flash of unwelcome recollection, and I saw myself worn and hungry and shabbily clothed, bending over my writing in my dreary lodging, wretched, yet amid all my wretchedness, receiving curious comfort from my own thoughts, which created beauty out of penury and love out of loneliness. This creative faculty was now dormant in me. It, I did very little and thought less, but I felt certain that this intellectual apathy was but a passing phase, a mental holiday, and a desirable sensation from brain work to which I was deservedly entitled after all my sufferings at the hands of poverty and disappointment. My book was nearly through the press, and perhaps the chiefest pleasure of any I now enjoyed was the correction of the proofs as they passed under my supervision. Yet, even this, the satisfaction of authorship, has its drawback, and my peculiar grievance was somewhat singular. I read my own work with gratification, of course, for I was not behind my contemporaries in thinking well of myself in all, uh, all I did, but my complacent literary egotism was mixed with a good deal of disagreeable astonishment and credulity, because my work, written with enthusiasm and feeling, propounded sentiments and incalculated theories which I personally did not believe in. Now, how had this happened, I asked myself. Why had I thus invited the public to accept me at false valuation? I paused to consider, and found the suggestion puzzling. How came I to write a book at all, seeing that it was utterly unlike me as I now knew myself? My pen, consciously or unconsciously, had written down things which my reasoning faculties entirely repudiated, such as belief in God, in a God, trust in the eternal possibilities of man's diviner progress. I credited neither of these doctrines. When I imagined such transcendental and foolish dreams, I was poor, starving, and without a friend in the world. Remembering all this, I promptly set down my so-called inspiration to the action of an ill-nourished brain. Yet there was something subtle in the teachings of the story, and one afternoon when I was revising some of the last proof sheets, I caught myself thinking that, a book was, that the book was nobler than its writer. This idea smote me with a sudden pang. I pushed my papers aside, and walking to the window, looked out. It was raining hard, and the streets were black with mud and slush. The foot passengers were drenched and miserable. The whole prospect was dreary, and the fact that I was a rich man did not in the least lift my mind from the depression that had stolen on me unawares. I was quite alone, for I had my own suite of rooms now in the hotel, not far from those occupied by Prince Romez. I also had my own servant, a respectable, good sort of fellow, whom I rather liked because he shared to the full in instinctive aversion I felt for the prince's man, Emile. Then I had my own carriage and horses with attendant coachman and groom, so that the prince and I, though the most intimate friends in the world, were able to avoid that familiarity which breeds contempt by keeping up our own separate establishments. On this particular afternoon, I was in a more miserable humor than ever my poverty had brought upon me, yet from a strict reasonable point of view, I had nothing to be miserable about. I was in full possession of my fortune, I enjoyed excellent health, and I had everything I wanted, with the added consciousness that if my wants increased, I could gratify them easily. The paragraph wheel under Lucio's management had been worked with such good effect that I had seen myself mentioned in almost every paper in London and the provinces as the famous millionaire, and for the benefit of the public, who are sadly uninstructed on these matters, I may here state as a very plain unvarnished truth that for forty pounds a well-known agency will guarantee the insertion of any paragraph, provided it is not libelous, in no less than four hundred newspapers. The art of booming is thus easily explained, and level-headed people will be able to comprehend why it is that a few names of authors are constantly mentioned in the press, while others, perhaps more deserving, remain ignored. Merit counts as nothing in such circumstances. Money wins the day, and the persistent paragraphing of my name, together with a description of my personal appearance and my marvelous literary gifts, combined with a deferential and almost awestruck allusion to the millions which made me so interesting. 
The paragraph was written out by Lucio and handed for circulation to the agency aforesaid with money down. All this, I say, bought upon me two inflictions. First, any amount of invitations to social and artistic functions, and secondly, a continuous stream of begging letters. I was compelled to employ a secretary who occupied a room near my suite, who was kept hard at work all day. Needless to say, I refused all appeals for money. No one had helped me in my distress, with the exception of my old chum Boffles. No one save he had given me even so much as a word of sympathy. I was resolved now to be as hard and as merciless as I had found my contemporaries. I had a certain grim pleasure in reading letters from two or three literary men, asking work as a secretary or companion, or, failing that, for the loan of a little cash to tide over present difficulties. One of these applicants was a journalist on the staff of a well-known paper who had promised to find me work, and who, instead of doing so, had, as I afterwards learned, strongly dissuaded his editor from giving me any employment. He never imagined that Tempest the Millionaire and Tempest the Literary Hack were one in the same person. So little did the majority think that the wealth can ever fall to the lot of authors. I wrote to him myself, however, and told him what I deemed it well he should know, adding my sarcastic thanks for his friendly assistance to me in time of need, and herein I tasted something of the sharp delight of vengeance. I never heard from him again, and I am pretty sure my letter gave him material not only for astonishment, but meditation. Yet with all the, yet with all the advantages over both friends and enemies which I now possessed, I could not honestly say I was happy. I knew I could have every possible enjoyment and amusement the world had to offer, yet I knew I was one of the most envied men among men, and yet, as I stood out looking out of the window at the persistent falling rain, I was conscious, conscious of a bitterness rather than a sweetness in the full cup of fortune. Many things that I had, many things that I had imagined uh, would give me intense satisfaction had fallen curiously flat. For example, I was, had flooded the press with the most carefully worded and prominent advertisements of my forthcoming book, and when I was poor I had pictured to myself how I should revel in doing this. Now that it was done, I cared nothing at all about it. I was simply weary of the sight of my own advertised name. I certainly did look forward with very genuine feeling and expectation to the publication of my work when that should be an accomplished fact. But today, even that idea had lost some of its attractiveness owing to this new and unpleasant impression on my mind, that the contents of that book were as utterly the reverse of my own true thoughts as they could well be. A fog began to darken down over the streets in, in, the company, in company with the rain, and disgust with the weather and with myself, I turned away from the window and settled into an armchair by the fire, poking the coal till it blazed and wondering what I should do to rid my mind of the gloom that threatened to envelop it as in a thick canopy. As that of the London fog, a tap came at the door, and in answer to my somewhat irritable come in, uh, Romanez entered. What? All in the dark, Tempest? he exclaimed cheerfully. Why don't you light up? The fire's enough, I answered crossly. Enough at any rate to think by. And have you been thinking? he inquired, laughing. Don't do it. It's a bad habit. No one thinks nowadays. People can't stand it. Their heads are too frail. Once begin once begin to think and down go to the foundations of society. Besides, thinking is always dull work. I have found it so, I said gloomily. Lucio, there's something is, is there something wrong about me somewhere? His eyes flashed keen, half amused inquiry into mine. Wrong? Oh no, surely not. What can there be wrong about you, Tempest? Are you not one of the richest men living? I let the satire pass. Listen, my friend, I said earnestly. You know I have been busy for the last fortnight correcting the proofs of my book for the press, do you not? He nodded with a smiling air. Well, I have almost, I have arrived almost at the end of my work, and I have come to the conclusion that the book is not me. It is not a re reflex, reflex of my feelings at all. And I cannot understand how I came to write it. You find it stupid, perhaps? said Lucio sympathetically. No, I answered with a touch of indignation. I do not find it stupid. Dull, then. No, it is not dull. Melodramatic? No, not melodramatic. Well, my good fellow, if it is not dull or stupid or melodramatic, what is it? he exclaimed merrily. It must be something. Yes, it is this. It is beyond me altogether. 
and I spoke with some bitterness. Quite beyond me. I could not write it now. I wonder I I wonder I could write it then. Lucio, I dare say I am talking foolishly, but it seems to me that I must have been on some higher altitude of thought when I wrote when I wrote the book, a height from which I have since fallen.